So, Jesus was a priest and a king? Well, what does that mean for me? Well, last time we were together, we talked about a fellow named Melchizedek. And he was a king and a high priest in the Old Testament. And I shared that I believe that he was a type of Christ. Uh, meaning, a representation of, but not Christ himself. That Jesus is truly our king and our priest. You know, having a king is an interesting concept. There aren't a lot of true monarchs in the world today. Now, there are kings, but historically, a king was a sovereign ruler. A sovereign king means that he's able to, um, or I should say a queen, or she's able to, uh, that they're the ultimate decision maker. When they make a decree, that decree becomes law. It becomes law just because they said so. Uh, those who remember your American history know that at the birth of the United States, um, England had a king named George III. He ruled England, and so people from England got on boats and came to what's now known as the United States. And while they were here, the King of England wanted to rule them in the same way he did when they were there. And the people here said, no, we do not want to be ruled by a king. Uh, you remember the old, um, uh, the old phrase, no, no taxation without representation, that he wanted them to pay taxes and do what he said, but they had no representatives over there. And as a result, the people here declared their independence from England. They wrote a document called the Declaration of Independence. And England said no <laughs> to their independence. And that was the beginning of the Revolutionary War. You know, today, England still has a monarch. Uh, they have a queen, but the queen is a representation of royalty, but she doesn't make legal decrees. There's a representative form of government over there um, that is charged to work on behalf of the people. Now, if you haven't watched the previous Bible study uh, where we discussed chapter 7 uh, of the book of Hebrews, I really suggest you go back and watch that one because it will help with this one to make more sense to you. Uh, because this guy, Melchizedek, he was a priest and a king that we met in Genesis chapter 14. And Abraham was on his way back from rescuing Lot and he met Melchizedek. And Melchizedek brought wine and bread and pronounced a blessing over Abraham, who was actually called Abram at this time. And Abram's response to the blessing was to give Melchizedek a tithe of the spoils from the war he just came from in rescuing Lot. Uh, most of us know this, but just in case you don't, a tithe means a tenth. And a biblical tithe means the first or the best tenth. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in another lesson. But here we see the principle of the tithe being established. It seems that this here was a free will offering to Melchizedek. And we can see that it came from the overflow of what God had provided. 
In Genesis 14, God had granted Abraham great victories over other kings and kingdoms. And there were tremendous spoils that came from those victories. And Melchizedek, a king, but also a priest of the Most High, pronounced a blessing over Abraham. And Abraham's natural response was generosity. Look, when God has blessed you, please make sure that you're being a blessing. If someone has blessed you, um, it's just right that you bless them. You know, we talked a little bit about this last week, but God established uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of those tribes was to be the priests, that their work was to take care of the temple. And the people were to bring offerings to the temple and the priests would live off of part of those offerings. Look, if you are being blessed by a Bible teacher, if you're being blessed by a preacher, if you're being blessed by a church, make sure you are blessing them. Amen? All right. Well, like Abraham, you want to be appreciative of what God has provided for you. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 4 through 7, we see the writer helping us to understand the idea of thanks and appreciation and giving. He points out that Abraham gave his tithe, the first tenth, to Melchizedek. Even though Melchizedek was not the beginning of the line for the Levitical priesthood. Abram was actually the beginning. That's why verses 6 and 7 say, uh, if you have your Bibles, open up to there. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. See, in verses 9 and 10, the writer puts an interesting twist. It's almost like um, some crazy time travel. Well, not really, but it, it feels like that to me. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 9. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father, when Melchizedek met him. What? Wait, what did he actually say there? He said, technically, Levi, <laughs> he said, technically, Levi, who is the one that set up to receive tithes, that God set up the priesthood through Levi, called them the Levites, and said, bring the offerings to them, uh, that he was technically the one that was set up to receive tithes, he actually paid a tithe to Melchizedek because he was in his father's loins when Abram <laughs> or Abram gave Melchizedek the tithe. In verses 11 and 12, the writer takes us through some really interesting turns. Uh, look at 11 and 12. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also change of the law. So he's saying Melchizedek is outside of the Levitical priesthood. But in the Levitical priesthood, we did not receive perfection or completion. We needed something beyond the law. So another priest, not in the order of Aaron, needed to rise. A priest like Melchizedek. Look, I hate to skip over the rest of chapter 7. Um, 
But if I don't, we won't get to chapter 8. <laughs> and, and that verse right there takes us right into chapter 8, verse 1. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. <laughs> so, so what's the main point here? That we do have a priest that is outside of the Levitical priesthood. And that is after the order of Melchizedek. And his name is... Jesus. And this priest, Jesus, has something to offer. Something that's better than anything that has ever been offered before. Look at verse 6 in chapter 8 of Hebrews. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator, a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. You see that right there? There is the good news. That right there is the gospel. That through Jesus we have a better covenant that's built on better promises. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait a minute. What are you talking about? A better covenant, better promises. Because you see, the Old Testament promises were of earthly blessing. That he would, that Abram, that he would have children, and that Abram would have children as many as the stars in the sky. That he would deliver them into a land flowing of milk and honey. See, but the New Testament promises are not mainly earthly like the Old Testament promises. The New Testament promises are of heavenly blessings. All we have to do is read a few more verses and we can see what they are. Look at, look at verse 8 of chapter 8. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord. For all shall know me from the last of them to the greatest of them. Look at verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So, what is a covenant? It's an agreement between at least two parties. In this case, the parties are God and his people. So, according to chapter 8, uh, the main point of all of this is that Jesus has made 
and provided a new agreement. And it's a better agreement all the way around. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Under the law, there were special offerings and sacrifices that had to be made on a regular basis. Not only that, you could not make them on your own. You had to go to the temple and you had to see the priest and you had to give your offering to the priest and the priest would offer it to God on your behalf. But in the new agreement, Jesus came and made an offering for you and he made an offering for me. And that offering was for all, once and for all, and no longer the blood of bulls and goats and doves were needed to cover your sins. It was a one-time offering that Jesus' blood didn't cover your sins, but that Jesus' blood washes your sins away. The Old Covenant says, I delivered them from the slavery of Egypt. But this covenant, I will establish a personal relationship with them in a way that they have never known. You see, with Jesus as the mediator, the one in the middle, <laughs> a need for a priest to stand between you and God no longer exists. It will be a personal relationship where God will put his law in your mind and he will write it on your heart and he will be your God and you will be his people and it doesn't matter who you are because that's the deal that's the deal if you're poor that's the deal if you're rich that's the deal if you're really smart and for those who may not be as smart that's the deal for them too that's not the deal for those who have always been on top or those who are always feel like they've been on the bottom. That's the deal for everybody, wherever you've been. God says this new covenant gives everyone access to a relationship with me without having anyone having to stand between us. But he doesn't stop there. He adds this in verse 12. Look at, look at verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. You see, that's the beauty of the new covenant. He says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. <laughs> Come on, you get that. Yeah, you know the thoughts that you have in your head that no one else knows. Uh, hearing this verse tells us God promises he will be merciful to the unrighteous. That's so powerful. Do you know what merciful means? You know the idea of mercy. It, it really means to hold back. So when you blow it <laughs> and you deserve to be punished by God, God says, I'm, I'm not going to do it. See, the rest of that verse says, and there sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more how great is that we all have been on one side of that or the other where we've hurt someone or someone has hurt us and there's no way to forget it you see that person and every time you see them you feel the pain and the anger from when they hurt you. And it feels like it's impossible to forget. But you did some dirt. And you, you went and you asked God's forgiveness. And He forgave you. And later on, that thing that you did is still bothering you. And one day you just can't take it anymore. And so you, you go to God and, and you say, that thing I did, God, last month, you know, I said I was sorry, but I, I really am sorry. Please forgive me. And God says, 
What thing? You did something? I don't remember that. Mike says that God will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. You see, in that it brings us back to the Jewish Jesus followers that Hebrews is written to. See, they have a long-standing relationship with the old covenant. (laughs) And this new covenant just has to seem weird to them. Look, have you ever talked to people that are not familiar with Christian faith and they want to know what it takes to be on good terms with God? What are the things that you have to do? What are the things that you have to stop doing? Um, And getting your arms around grace is a difficult thing when all of you've had in your life and your background is the idea of the law. There is always this idea that I have to do something. There's no way I can just say a prayer and be okay with God. It can't be that easy. There has to be more to it. So we look at Ephesians 2.8 and and 2.9 and they become a stumbling block for people who do not understand the idea of grace. Here's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The idea that grace is for those who don't deserve it. It's for those who haven't earned it. So that means it's for all of us. None of us have been good enough to earn our way into heaven. None of us will get to heaven and tell God, I deserve to be here on my own merits. The Hebrew Christians needed to hear that. They needed that pounded into their heads. And you know what? Some of us do too. We live in a merit-based society. You get what you earn. And we try to translate that thinking to God. You know, I was talking to a man this past week um, whose mother recently passed from Alzheimer's and he taught me a valuable lesson about God's love that he learned while he was caring for his mom. She no longer knew him. She could no longer care for herself. She was even ornery and mean as some Alzheimer's will cause people to be. He explained to me how uh, he came to understand God's love through his mom. His mom had nothing left to offer him except hard work, abuse, and pain. This wasn't a choice she was making. It was just the reality of the situation. True love, God's love, agape love. This is the picture of grace. There is nothing you can do in that moment to deserve it. But you get it anyway. He could have put his mother into a facility that would have cared for people in her condition. And she wouldn't have known that he did it. But he would know that he did not sacrificially love his mother. And that is God's love toward us. We have nothing to offer Him. We regularly cause Him pain. Yeah, He loves us and He cares for us and He provides for us and is patient with us. See, the Hebrew Christians of the first century had a hard time getting their arms around the idea of God's grace. His unmerited favor. So the writer of Hebrews sat down to write them a letter to tell them that you love and you believe in angels, but Jesus is better than angels. Jewish people, you have your heroes, but Jesus is better than Moses. Children of Israel, you have your priests that went to God on your behalf, but Jesus is better than 
than those priests. And those priests, they would offer sacrifices to cover your sins. But Jesus is better than those sacrifices because Jesus' perfect blood was the perfect sacrifice to perfectly wash your sins away forever. Jesus is better.